Thank you. Uh, okay, we uh, come to the last session on this topic uh, for now, and uh, as we do that, uh, let's read the word together. We will read in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. And we'll read from verse 11. It's Revelation 19, verse 11, and it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the Lord allows his own blessing to the reading of his word. <coughs> Let's just ask for his help. <coughs> Gracious Father, again we come before you. Father, we thank you so much for the teaching of this week. As the person of the Lord Jesus Christ was opened up to us in the Gospels, Oh, Father, we just want to love him more. And Father, we thank you too, Father, for the practical instruction with regard to walking in the Spirit so that we will bring honor to thy great name and so that you will be glorified. And Father, as we uh, finish this session and looking at uh, your plans throughout the ages from the beginning of the world to the end, Father, we just come before you in humility when we realize what a great, powerful, almighty God you are to move nations, to move kings, to deal with people who were your enemies and yet, Father, you provided a way for those people, us, to know you intimately. And so, Father, as we come to you tonight, we would just ask for your help again as we consider your word, help in trying to speak about it, and help also, Father, to retain it in our hearts and in our minds. And once again, Father, our goal is that we would be changed and that we be tonight and tomorrow and the day after and the day after. <coughs> be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ask these things and ask you to continue with us now in his wonderful name. Amen. Amen. So we've talked about the kingdom and uh, we have seen God work through the ages and we saw the great victory that there was on the cross as the Lord did everything that was absolutely necessary uh, to gain salvation for his creatures, but also to uh, uh, defeat Satan. And uh, now we're going to look at the remainder of God's work in taking care of Satan, in establishing the kingdom, and in bringing many sons to glory. And so uh, that's what we're going to look at now. Uh, we've mentioned that other ideas, uh, which we believe are not biblical ideas, but other ideas uh, would suggest that the kingdom is present now. But here's some reasons why uh, I don't think we can say that. Number one, when you look at Psalm 2, we find that Christ is God's king, but he's presently not ruling on the earth. Although the scripture says that's where he'll rule. And then secondly, Daniel's prophecy that we looked at informs us that God's kingdom will crush and destroy all other kingdoms. Uh, but there's lots of kingdoms still around today. And so that hasn't occurred yet. 
And God's kingdom's literal and physical and is to replace once and for all other literal and physical kingdoms. And that hasn't happened yet. And so as we think about these things, we see some requirements that there are for God's kingdom to be present. And so number four here, God's kingdom uh, needs to be, if it's going to be present, it requires Israel as a nation to be in obedience to their Messiah. And that hasn't happened. Uh, certainly portions of the nation of Israel, uh, for instance, in Tel Aviv, that area, uh, it's as wicked as New York or in other places. So they're not in obedience to their Messiah and they don't recognize him as their king. And so today that's not true of Israel, so the kingdom isn't present. And then the presence and operation of the king and the kingdom require 100% fulfillment of the terms of which covenant? Or which covenant? The Abrahamic covenant, right? Because if God doesn't fulfill those terms, then he's a liar and we cannot trust him and he's not God. And so uh, these haven't been fulfilled yet either because if they were fulfilled, Israel would have the whole of the land that God had promised to them. They would have the king on the throne, the Davidic king, and as well as that, the law of God would be written in their hearts and they would be believers in the Lord Jesus. So these are some reasons uh, why the kingdom is not present. And so if uh, someone was talking to you and telling you that it is present, uh, perhaps you can use some of these things to suggest that it's not. Now, uh, as we have left the Old Testament, of course we left the Old Testament and we came into Matthew and we looked at John, uh, but in Zechariah in the Old Testament we have much about the king and the kingdom. And so just a few verses in Zechariah 12.10, we may go back there again tonight. It says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And that, I would suggest, is when the Lord emerges from heaven to return to the earth, as we'll see uh, in a few moments as we look at some other passages. And uh, so they recognize their Messiah, and it strikes them immediately what they did to him as a nation. And uh, they mourn. It's interesting that very soon after that verse, they are told to stop mourning. It's a day of joy. Uh, and then Zechariah 13, 1, it says, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And so the nation will, who survive the tribulation period will turn to him in belief. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? And then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friend. There's a number of things that are in that verse that we won't deal with, but certainly uh, I think the obvious reference is to the wounds of the Lord Jesus. And then in Zechariah 14.9, it tells us the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. So that's what we're heading towards. And uh, as we head towards that, uh, we look at some uh, of the things <coughs> that precede that. And so we are, if you like, still in this age of grace. We haven't reached the kingdom age yet, but we're still in the age of grace. And as we are, uh, we think about the tribulation because we're thinking of those years uh, that were mentioned to Daniel the 490 years, seven of which are still hanging out there in the wind, if you like, and have still to be fulfilled. And so uh, that interim period that includes the church uh, will suggest that we've jumped over that for the moment and we come to the tribulation period and those seven years now go into operation. There are two things that are necessary uh, for 
the tribulation to begin. One of them is, if you like, uh, in the nature of getting something out of the way, and the other one is a very definite uh, move that actually uh, strikes the beginning of the tribulation period. So the first one is the rapture, uh, because God has been working two different programs. Now they'll all come together eventually in the end, and uh, in a particular way, and uh, God will bring uh, everything to a conclusion. Uh, but we have the program of God for Israel, and we know that that was suspended uh, when the uh, nation uh, rejected their Lord in his first advent. And so we talked about that being suspended, talks about in Romans 9, 10, and 11, that they're set aside for a time. And now God is going to start working with them again because he's now going to take the church out of the way. It's uh, like having two things to do, and we're only going to do one thing at a time. And so God works with Israel to the postponement point. He works with the church in the interim period. And then he takes the church out of the way so that, again, he can concentrate basically on the one thing, and that is the nation of Israel. And so that starts... Uh, or that uh, is God's work uh, to clear the tables for dealing with Israel. Now, there's some thought that uh, after the rapture, there may still be a little time before the tribulation period actually uh, starts. Well, I'll leave that to you to figure out whether there is or not. But certainly the thing that specifically starts the tribulation <coughs> period is the covenant between Israel and the Antichrist. That's the switch that flicks and starts everything in motion for those seven years. And so that, in this covenant, uh, uh, if we went back to Daniel, we'd see the covenant uh, that is one that where Antichrist guarantees peace for Israel. Uh, because by that time, the nations are really closing in on them. They're closing in today. I mean, Israel's <coughs> friends are leaving. Uh, they temporarily get some new friends, etc., some new nations, uh, but overall uh, the nations will gather against Israel, and even if they don't make an actual move, they are antagonistic to Israel and they uh, want Israel out of the way. And so this is the specific trigger that starts the tribulation on earth. Along with that, then, uh, it, when the church is uh, taken to glory with the Lord Jesus, uh, then we have uh, the first of a series of judgments that happen at the same time. And so we have the Bema Seat Judgment for Believers, which is a judgment of reward. And uh, then there will be three other judgments to follow as time progresses. And uh, we will see those uh, when we get there. There will be the judgment of Israel. That's at the end of the tribulation. There's the judgment of the sheep and goats. And that's at the end of the tribulation. And then there's the great white throne judgment for unbelievers when the earth and the heavens are dissolved and wrapped up. And uh, they appear before the judge, the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, we're not going to dwell on uh, the judgment of believers, just to note that that occurs, uh, I believe, when we are raptured and we go to be with the Lord. And the first thing that occurs is that we come before him in this judgment of reward. Now, when we get to the last book of the Bible, of course, it's called the Revelation. Uh, and uh, people call it the revelations, and uh, that kind of uh, screws up the whole intent of the thing. And the reason it does is because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the word that is used is apocalypsis, from which we get apocalyptic. Uh, that's where it comes from. Uh, but apocalypsis simply means an unveiling, an uncovering. And the book of the Revelation is not revelations. That 
that designation would concentrate on the events in the book, but that's not God's intention. That's not God's concentration. God is concentrating on his son. And so it is the revelation or the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, when he came to the earth the first time, he was veiled in flesh, wasn't he? But not anymore. Now he's going to be unveiled. And the earth will see him in his glory, in his power, in his majesty. Uh, I like what Henry Morris says. It must be stressed that revelation means unveiling, not veiling. Because there are so many people that just say, well, you can't understand the book of Revelation. Well, if that's true, the Lord's a little not very kind to us, is he? He gives us something we can't understand. And so uh, the emphasis is that it's the unveiling of Christ. And we can understand what it says. And then we see in the book of the Revelation the purpose of prophecy. This verse was mentioned earlier. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And again, everything that we're looking at as we move to the kingdom, it is all to result in the worship of God. And uh, it is all through the Lord Jesus Christ, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's all ultimately about God. Uh, and that's, that is quite right, isn't it? I mean, everything in the scripture is about the glory of God. Of course, in the Old Testament, the Lord says a couple of times, I won't give my glory to another. And so everything that's going to be done as the kingdom comes in, it will all result in glory to God. If you're studying the book of the Revelation, you come across name after name after name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going through them, but I encourage you to look at all those names as you go through the, the book of the Revelation. Of course, it starts with the seven churches, and uh, as well as being specific churches of the time, uh, we can also look at it as a an overview of the history of the church. And then we move into Revelation chapter 4, and we begin to see uh, God on the throne. And as we move along <coughs> into uh, further into uh, chapter 4 and chapter 5, we see this wonderful view of the throne room of heaven. And uh, as well as that, uh, we, in chapter 5, we come across the book with the seven seals, or the scroll with the seven seals. And in effect, and we'll not, we're, because we are short of time, we just have to deal with the surface of this. We're not going to go through and prove this. But certainly that scroll is really the title deed for the earth. How did we get that? To give it to the one who was the lamb. Well, we got it because... Remember, in John told us, the Lord himself told us, now, right now, is Satan taken care of. He's defeated now. And so because he's defeated, uh, then that which he stole in the garden is about to be repossessed. And that scroll then comes uh, to the Lord. And uh, it says... In chapter 5, verse 5, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And so uh, when he takes that book, then we have this eruption of worship, and uh, quite rightly so, uh, because the Lord is now entering in to the good of the victory that he won at the cross. And so he's about to act uh, in judgment, uh, but he is in the process now of taking control of the earth. And uh, he will bring in his kingdom as a result. And so uh, we see this overview of world history 
Old Testament time up to Messiah's death, uh, coming and death, and then the church age, and then the rapture, and the tribulation. And uh, we would suggest that the second advent of the Lord Jesus, his coming to the earth, not the air, uh, is at the end of the tribulation period. Of course, there's other views on that, and I would suggest they don't stand up to examination uh, for various reasons. But that will not be our uh, study tonight. And so uh, once the tribulation is finished and the Lord comes to the earth, then you'll notice that we have the kingdom on earth and then finally the eternal state. So that's where we're going. Of course, we have the various judgments that are poured out on the earth. And uh, we have the seals from the scroll then the trumpets, and then the bowls or vials. Just another one the same. So again, as we see, examine the truth of Scripture, we find that this seven years has two very definite three-and-a-half-year parts. And the dividing line in it is uh, the uh, abomination of desolation. And uh, in Matthew chapter 24... Uh, you'll remember the disciples asked the Lord some questions. It says, as he sat upon Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, first question, when shall these things be? Because he had just told them that uh, this temple was going to be taken down. And then the second question, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And so as we uh, go through chapters 24 and 25, uh, we have the Lord's answer that covers the tribulation, it covers the second coming, uh, it covers uh, judgment uh, at the end of the tribulation for sheep and goats, etc. And there's a number of parables that the Lord takes to support what he has told them. But in verse 15 of chapter 24, uh, we have the midpoint of the tribulation says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And we'll see, uh, or if we went on and read in Revelation, we would find a very good reason for them fleeing to the mountains because Antichrist has just broken the treaty with them that he signed to give them peace in the first three and a half years. And now he is literally going to uh, put everything into high gear to wipe them out. Why? Because in chapter 12, he's been thrown out of heaven. There's a war between him and Michael, the archangel Michael and his troops. And uh, Satan is finally expelled from heaven, not even to have that uh, whatever uh, access it was that he had that we see in the book of Job, etc., he won't have this anymore. And as you go to Revelation chapter 12, you find that he is absolutely mad uh, in being cast to the earth in chapter 12 and verse 13. It says, When the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And that refers back to the first part of the chapter that's talking about is, uh, Satan uh, seeking to uh, kill the Lord Jesus when Israel produced the man-child, the man-child being the Lord Jesus. And so uh, in uh, verses 12, 13 through 17, uh, we find that Satan now is mad as a hatter for having gotten thrown out of heaven, being defeated by Michael in that war. And now he's cast to the earth, and he is going to redouble all his efforts to get rid of Israel, because he knows that God will work through Israel to bring in the kingdom. And so in verse 17, it says, The dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So terrible times. And this portion of the tribulation period is generally called the Great Tribulation. Now, during uh, the tribulation, there has to be a temple. Uh, because if Antichrist is going to desecrate the temple, 
And if he's going to set up an image of himself in the temple, there has to be a temple. And uh, we've already mentioned uh, in various sessions the fact that uh, in Israel today there are all sorts of moves being made to move towards uh, rebuilding the temple. Uh, there has even been some who have surreptitiously tried to get up there to uh, offer sacrifice. I think uh, they were run off pretty quickly by the authorities. So there's going to be this temple, it's going to be desecrated. Uh, the uh, Jews will, uh, I suspect, don't quote me on this, this is an opinion, uh, when it comes to Antichrist signing a treaty with them uh, at the uh, beginning of the tribulation period, I think it's two things that will uh, have them accept that. One is the prospect of having peace, and the other, I think, is going to be the prospect that they will be allowed to operate in their temple. And even if it's not fully built then, or they haven't started, that they're allowed to build the temple and they're allowed to reinstitute their worship. And so, uh, one way or another, there's to be a temple in the tribulation. So as we uh, think about the temples, of course, there was Solomon's temple, uh, which uh, replaced eventually the tabernacle. And then uh, after they came back from Babylon uh, under Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua, then there was Zerubbabel's uh, post-exilic temple, that is after the exile. And now their third temple will be the tribulation period temple, but there's another one to come, and that will be the temple that the Lord himself builds in the millennium when he establishes his kingdom. The names that are given in the scripture for these seven years, the tribulation, of course the reference is there, the great tribulation, back in Jeremiah, the time of Jacob's trouble, and the key one is the day of the Lord. As you go to the Old Testament, you find that the day of the Lord is always uh, <coughs> connected with the wrath of God and God bringing discipline or, or judgment. So we find, uh, again, going back to Daniel's prophecies, that everything that's happening in the tribulation and the kingdoms that come against Israel uh, everything will be terminated. Uh, by that time, uh, the, the revived Roman Empire uh, will be active, and as all of the nations at the end of the tribulation move against Israel, God uh, will, by the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of his mouth, uh, which is in the area that we read at the very beginning in Revelation 19, uh, the Lord will come and he will deal with all of those nations. And so he's pictured, as we saw, as this great rock that comes and smashes these kingdoms, and then the rock itself grows into the kingdom of the Lord himself. Of course, along with that, there's the resurrections. We'll not go into detail. Uh, but uh, there's the resurrection of saints, the church, and also the living saints whose bodies are changed, as we find in 1 Corinthians 15, and that is the rapture. And then uh, uh, there's some uh, different opinions as to when the Old Testament saints are raised, and my suggestion, and I think we don't have time to go into tonight, but I, I would suggest that that is at the end of the tribulation period, where Old Testament saints are also raised. And uh, included in that is the last of the Old Testament saints. And who would they be? Well, that'd be the tribulation period saints, because that seven years really is the last seven years of the Old Testament, isn't it? Uh, because uh, the prophecy was given for 490 years to Daniel's people in Daniel's city, and uh, it was a postponement of those seven years, 
And so really what we have in the tribulation is the last seven years of the Old Testament time. And so I would suggest that along with the tribulation saints, which it makes it plain, or raise them, that we also have the resurrection of the Old Testament saints uh, just before uh, they enter into the uh, thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus. Uh, sorry, I'm just checking my times again. Where are we at? Okay, we're good. <laughs> uh, so Israel during the tribulation, uh, just very quickly, uh, as you do a quick survey of Revelation, they've safety in the land for three and a half years uh, under uh, Antichrist protection. Uh, however, the nation, just like today, is in the land in unbelief. And uh, the... Uh, when the nation was reformed in 1948, they came back not in belief, but in unbelief. And they continue in unbelief today, as they will in the tribulation period. And uh, they then are subject to the discipline of God in the form of the sealed, sealed judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. And uh, the, I would suggest, if, if we can split it up in this way, I would suggest that God's primary purpose in the tribulation is the uh, disciplining judgment that he brings on Israel. And all of, these, all of these judgments from the seals, the trumpets, and the, the bowls are all uh, for Israel to bring them to that point where they have absolutely no other option but to recognize the Lord when he comes and believe in him. Otherwise, they're done forever. Now, of course, secondarily then, uh, God is judging the Gentile nations. So they're not exempt uh, from all of the effects of these judgments. But God has a primary purpose, and that is to bring his nation that he loves back to himself. And Israel during that time will be subject to military attack. We see in Ezekiel 38, uh, we see a movement of nations. Uh, call, it's called the battle, or the, it's really more of a campaign that starts during the tribulation, continues to the end, I would suggest, and uh, becomes part of the great uh, move against the Lord Jesus Christ right at the end of the tribulation called Armageddon. Uh, but it's called Gog and Magog. And it's very interesting to look at the nations that are involved in that and to see even in our day how those exact nations are coming together. They're making treaties with each other. There's all sorts of movement that's going on. And it certainly seems as though they are lining up. They're being lined up for this tribulation period. As well as that, we have uh, in... Uh, when the Lord exercises judgment, he always accompanies it with mercy. And so uh, we have 144 uh, gospel preachers, 144,000 gospel preachers uh, from uh, the various tribes of Judah, except for two tribes that aren't mentioned. Anybody know what they are? Dan. Dan and? Levi. No. Ephraim. Mm -hmm. Why might that be? We're not given an explanation as to why that is, but if you think back to the Old Testament, where did idolatry start in Israel? Yeah. So that's one possible explanation. You'll remember that the uh, idols were set up in the tribal area of Dan and also in the tribal area of Ephraim. So possibly that could be an explanation for why uh, the 144,000 are from the other tribes. And you say, well, that would make 14 tribes. Yeah, but you look at it and you'll find uh, that some of the tribes are regarded as two. Okay. Anyway, you go into that, have a look at it. And then we have the two Jewish witnesses, the two witnesses uh, that the Lord allows to harass the people of the earth and uh, also uh, give God's word. And of course, they kill them. The, war, the earth is allowed to kill them. Uh, and uh, not only do they kill them, but they, they have a party. It's a worldwide party. And so you find that there's, they're sending gifts to each other. 
and they're just having a great old time and they're leaving the bodies lying in the streets of Jerusalem. And guess what? Well, after three days, the Lord raises them up and the whole world is shocked. So a very, uh, a very evident witness of God's power. And of course, we see several times in uh, the <coughs> Revelation that despite everything, they still curse God and they don't want to have anything to do with God even when they are in agony through the various judgments that God has brought. And then, of course, we have the desecration of the temple and uh, this satanically motivated uh, persecution that we have looked at in Revelation 12 and the attempted extermination of the whole of the nation at that particular point. And when you go to Revelation 13 and you see there the rise of Antichrist and the false prophet, uh, we uh, look in that chapter, and again, uh, on the basis of what the scriptures say uh, about land and about sea, uh, at the beginning of chapter 13, it says, I stood upon the sand of the sea. And if you remember, uh, when we talked about John and the Lord leaving the house of Israel, he went down to the seaside. And uh, the sea, again, is often thought of as the Gentile nations. And so possibly the Antichrist comes out of the Gentile nations. And then <clears throat> in the uh, same chapter and verse 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So he comes out of the earth or the land, and so possibility that the false prophet is Jewish, because when we think about the land, that was everything for the Jew. Mm -hmm. All the promises about land, the land that they had, etc. And uh, as you go through the scripture, it's all about the land. We already mentioned that Satan uh, sought to uh, kill the Lord Jesus. This is uh, chapter 12, and it is the great red dragon who is approaching the woman who is delivering the child, the woman being Israel and the child being the Lord Jesus. Already mentioned the Antichrist. And then in chapter 13, uh, we get this picture of the Antichrist uh, with all of these heads. Uh, the seven heads, I would suggest to you, are the nations that have uh, persecuted Israel over the years. And so starting with Egypt, uh, the first five, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, not Medco, Medo, and Greece. And then that which was present in John's day, Rome, and now in uh, the end of time, the revived Roman Empire. Not mention that. Uh, that's, this is uh, Gog and Magog. And these are all the nations that will come against Israel during the tribulation period, at a period, and then also will continue on to join in at the end in Armageddon. So let's move on. We have the marriage of the Lamb in uh, chapter 19, and then the return of the Lord to the earth, as we read earlier. So as we uh, we'll just take a few moments to get into the actual kingdom, and so we have Christ's earthly kingdom being established. So if we have a look at chapter 20, and uh, so in, in chapter 20, uh, at the beginning, the first thing that happens is that Satan is imprisoned for a thousand years. Uh, in verses 1 through 3. And then in verse 4, uh, John says, I saw thrones and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which worshipped the beast. And uh, once we get down and we see those who have believed and have not ex received the mark of the beast in their foreheads, says they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So this is the institution of the Lord's uh, kingdom on earth. And in Zechariah, uh, we won't have time to turn and look at all the verses, 
uh, but it tells us that when the Lord comes, he descends to the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives splits, and uh, it changes the whole topography of the place. And so in the kingdom, uh, if you've been to Israel, and some of you have, uh, if you went back, when the kingdom begins, you wouldn't recognize where you'd been, because the topography of the whole place is going to change when the Lord comes. Oops. Get rid of that. There we go. Uh, just another view. We'll not talk about all the prophetic events. So now we're at the Abrahamic covenant. So what's going to happen in when the kingdom comes in? Well, uh, if we thought in terms of those judgments, in, in Ezekiel chapter 20, you see the judgment of the Jews who emerge from the tribulation alive. And Zechariah tells us that it is one-third of the nation that entered the tribulation. So two-thirds of the nation will be wiped out during the tribulation period. And that one-third then comes under the judgment of God. But in what happens, they have seen him, they've recognized him as Messiah, and they've turned to him. But in Ezekiel chapter 20, it tells us that they are judged in the wilderness. Why the wilderness? Uh, why not in Israel? And I would suggest to you that this is because they undergo a judgment that confirms that they are fit to enter the kingdom having believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it tells us there that they go under the rod. And I would suggest to you that that is like the shepherd's rod. And you think of John chapter 10, where all those sheep are in the sheepfold together. And as they come out in the morning, the flocks are all mixed up. And as they come out, the shepherd uses the rod to indicate those that are his. And so I would suggest that we have that similar uh, picture in Ezekiel with regard to the Jews who emerge alive from the tribulation period as they undergo this judgment and are reckoned to be fit by belief in the Lord Jesus Christ to enter into the kingdom. And then you also have the judgment of the sheep and goats, and that's the Gentile nations. That's in Matthew 25. And so again, the, they are judged, and the goats go then to the lake of fire. That's the unbelievers. And those who have believed during the tribulation period, Gentile believers, enter into the kingdom uh, with the Lord. <clears throat> the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled. They receive their land. If you look in Ezekiel 48, you will see the land appears to be divided among the nations with uh, various in various strips. And right in the center of it is Christ's portion and the new temple, Christ's temple. And he will rule from there as the king and as the high priest. He is the priest king in the order of Melchizedek. And so he takes his place in uh, the nation. And you'll notice that the division of the land goes right out to the Euphrates River and goes down into the river of Egypt. Satan is dealt with at the beginning of chapter 20. He's imprisoned for a thousand years. In verse 7 in chapter 20, he is released for a period, and he goes out to deceive the nations. Now, how does he get support? So he's been imprisoned. Now, let's think about that for a second, then we'll come back to his support. He is imprisoned for those thousand years, which means that as the Lord reigns in his kingdom, there is righteousness in the kingdom. There is no satanic or demonic activity in the kingdom. When you go to the Old Testament, you find uh, that it is a time of great peace. It's a time of extended life spans. The sun is seven times brighter, it tells us in Isaiah. There is all sorts of beauty, etc. But those who entered the kingdom, who were believers, 
those believing Jews who came out of the tribulation, the believing Gentiles who came out of the tribulation period, and went in to populate the uh, kingdom, along with you and I, by the way, in our glorified bodies, and uh, all who have been resurrected who will be there as part of the population and have different responsibilities. But those men and women who came out of the tribulation and entered into the kingdom, they uh, have believed, but their children, when they are born, they're born just like you and I. And so they need to believe. Uh, they are not born believers. They are just like you and I today. So as the population explodes, as it will, as we see uh, ex uh, explained in the Old Testament, you now have people who will personally put their faith in the Lord during the kingdom period, but you will have many who do not. And they are the ones that are being ruled with the rod of iron. Remember it tells us in Psalm 2 about the Lord ruling with a rod of iron? That's why he has to rule with a rod of iron. It's because there are unregenerate people there whose natural tendency is rebellion against God. And so it is when Satan is released at the end of the thousand years that he finds a ready population that he can call on and he will call on them. And in verse 8 it says, He shall go out to deceive the nations in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. The number of them is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And so uh, this is the end of the thousand years. Why does God imprison Satan for a thousand years rather than just dealing with him forever? Well, that's the test of the seventh dispensation. The, remember, each dispensation was a test. And the test of the seventh dis dispensation, the kingdom dispensation, is to put man in an ideal uh, society, a society of righteousness, a society with no satanic influence at all for a thousand years. And it shows that the wickedness of the heart of man, the flesh, exhibits itself. And eventually, when it has the opportunity at the end of the thousand years, it breaks out in open rebellion against God. And so it is God proving all those other things I did. You might be able to blame it on somebody else. You might be able to blame it on something else. But in the kingdom period on the earth, you can't blame it on any of those things because you had ideal conditions. And your sin, the sinful heart, rose up and was showed its true colors. So, anyway, uh, our time is well gone, but let me just uh, finish uh, with regard to a couple of things. There's lots more <laughs> with regard to the kingdom on earth. One of them is the uh, temple that will be built in those days. Uh, you know, from the scriptures, we see, uh, uh, or from scripture and history, we see the dimensions of the various temples that there were. There was the tabernacle. It's the little brown thing in the middle. Then there's Solomon's temple, the blue one. Uh, eventually, when Herod did all sorts of renovations in Christ's day, the green one was the size of Herod's temple. But in the millennium, that's the size of Christ's temple. And the king, this is the king's headquarters, and he will rule uh, from there. So the, there will be this temple, and the Lord will rule. At the end of the millennium, and the end of the kingdom on the earth, uh, we will enter into the eternal kingdom, which is Revelation 21 and 22. But... As all of this is occurring, we find that God destroys the earth. Why would he do that? Why would he not just leave it hanging in space? And can I suggest to you that he is dealing with it uh, because it is corrupt because of the sin of man?
that has corrupted the earth. You'll remember that the judgment was that now the earth is going to bring forth thorns and everything else, and this earth is corrupt. And so in Second Peter, it tells us the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. That's Galatians 5, isn't it? That's you and I. And then, as the earth is rolled up and destroyed and dissolved in, in fire, uh, we have the great white throne judgment. And uh, we're not given a location. It doesn't say it happens in heaven. It doesn't say it happens on earth before the earth is dealt with. And so somewhere in the Lord's universe, uh, the great white throne judgment occurs. And all who are unbelievers uh, are, appear before it and they are consigned to the lake of fire. And in the lake of fire are already Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And we see that in Revelation 19, 20, and also in uh, uh, Revelation 20 and verse, uh, verse 10, where the left, Satan is consigned to the lake of fire. And so we, uh, we see this end and the beautiful... Uh, kingdom of God will continue into eternity and as it moves into eternity we find this recorded in uh, chapter 22 he showed me a pure river of water of life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb there's a throne here this is the kingdom continued it's eternal and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which had twelve manner of fruits, which bare twelve, uh, and yielded for fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. It's done with. You'll never be troubled by sin, by anything that would bring the judgment of God but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. Get ready for work, because we're going to be working in the eternal state. Work is good, work is instituted of God, and we will be serving him there. And it says, they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And so when we, in First John, are told that at the rapture we will see the Lord face to face, we will continue on seeing him, and in the eternal state, we shall see his face. We shall feast on him. And uh, it says his name shall be in their foreheads. He owns us, <clears throat> and that's a good thing. And there shall be no more night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever we reign with Christ in eternity what a wonderful blessing this is and if you read down chapter 21 you see these wonderful pictures of the place uh, of the new heavens the new earth and the new Jerusalem and uh, the first heaven and the first earth pass away and the Lord brings his creation down from heaven a new heaven a new earth the holy city new Jerusalem Remember Adam wait, or Abraham waited for a city who's, uh, the foundation of which and the builder of which and the maker of which was God. That's where we're going. And uh, as you see Israel in the eternal kingdom, they become part of the structure, the nation. Uh, we see them represented with all these stones and we see this wonderful city that comes down from heaven. It has been calculated, given the, the uh, measurements in Revelation 21, of a cube. Uh, it's a cube. It gives us a picture of a cube. And that cube is uh, 2,537,716,000. 2,
544 cubic miles. That's the city. That's the measurements that are given. This will be phenomenal. And then we have the tree of life. And this, to finish off, is the why of it all. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Then comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. See? He finishes off on the earth and delivers up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. In other words, God is still God. And uh, when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. So that, and here's the end play, that God may be all in all. And the Son has finished the work that he was given to do. And I encourage you to think about the Lord in this way. Can he do this right from creation to the very end and exhibit power, exhibit compassion, exhibit love, exhibit his just nature? Uh, this is the God that we serve and the God that we adore. And I just encourage you to walk closely with him in the spirit as we have been hearing and in adoration of the Lord Jesus Christ as we have seen in the gospel. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again. I thank you, Father, for the patience of the men as we have gone long tonight. And I thank you, Father, for your great mercy towards us. And Father, the God that we adore, the Son of God that we love, Father, we pray that he might become ever more precious to us. And Father, we just look forward to that day when we will be with him. And then when he emerges from heaven in his second coming, Father, we just look so forward to being with him then and living in the kingdom on earth. And then, Father, going on into the eternal kingdom. Oh, Father, what days that will be. And as we see him throughout eternity, in a place where there's no need of a son, because the brightness of the glory of the Father and of the Son bring the light to that whole world. Oh, Father, we can't even imagine. <coughs> and so, Father, as we finish tonight, we bow in adoration and in worship, and we recognize you for who you are, and we thank you that we puny creatures have been privileged to receive your love and to receive that wonderful salvation that you have provided in the person of thy dear, precious Son. So, Father, we thank you now again in his name, the name of the beautiful Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.